Good morning, and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian. We are glad that you've joined us online, and if you have just stumbled upon our worship service or someone in our church recommended it to you, then a special welcome to you. We would love to hear from you. If you have any questions about who First Presbyterian is, then feel free to email myself, Heather, or our senior pastor, Witt. Uh, we would love to hear from you at any time. Friends, this morning we will celebrate the sacrament of communion. And so now, if you do not have your elements already prepared, now would be a perfect time to do that. As Witt has mentioned earlier, things in your house that you already have are just fine. Juice, tea, bread, or crackers will all be sufficient um, for you to celebrate communion in your home as we celebrate it in worship wanted to just announce and celebrate the several marriages that have gone, um, that have taken place in our church family over the last few weeks. We celebrate Melissa Chatto and Sam Billings. We celebrate the marriage of Reg Williams and Cabo Mua. And we celebrate the marriage of Carrie Smith and Brantley Scott. Please extend your congratulations to those families as you, um, encounter them as if you wanted to send an email or, you know, pick up the phone. Any of those would be fine. I want Catherine to make a special announcement about this afternoon. As a reminder, at 5 p.m. today in the church parking lot, we are going to have our graduate parade to celebrate our 2020 graduates. Um, the graduates and their families will be in the parking lot and are looking forward to seeing you, their church family. And so if you will, we are going to have cars enter from 2nd Avenue, the new parking lot, and then you will exit off onto 3rd Avenue. So we hope to see you all at 5 today. Welcome. Let us begin worship.
in the midst of the world's chaos, we come as God's people to find peace. When your mind is overwhelmed with what you see, we come as God's people to find hope. If your heart is heavy with fear, with worry, with sorrow, come as God's people and find strength. As you long for community in a world that is torn apart, Come as God's people and find love. Come, people of God, and in this moment, find peace, hope, strength, and love as we worship and pray together. Let us pray together this morning. God in three persons, blessed Trinity, we ask for your presence to enter this space, enter our homes, enter our hearts. We know that in self-giving love, your very nature teaches us how to love one another. Father and Creator, Son and Redeemer, Spirit and Advocate. We call upon you to teach us this day. Teach us to pray. Teach us to love. Teach us to be one as you are one. Teach us to celebrate our diversity as you have made us. With all of our divisions that we create with our own biases from social class to race, from gender to age, from ability to different abilities. We know we still have much to learn. So Lord, teach us this day, we pray. Amen. Today we celebrate the class of 2020. Although this baccalaureate service looks different than it has in years past, some things remain the same. One of those things is that as a church family, we are immensely grateful to have known and grown with our graduates in this community of faith. Graduates, although we are not physically able to gather in this moment, may you know the love of your faith family. They are here in this moment and will be there wherever you go, wherever your journey takes you. 
At this time, it is my privilege to share with you the high school and college graduating class of 2020. Katherine Glaze, graduate of University Christian High School, attending Western Carolina University. Timmy Hartman, graduate of Challenger Early College High School with an associate's degree, pursuing his pilot's license. Chase Johnson, graduate of Hickory High School, attending Duke University. Clegg Monroe, graduate of Hickory High School, attending App State University. Peter Weber, graduate of Episcopal High School, attending the University of South Carolina. Henry Winfield, graduate of University Christian High School, attending Clemson University. Morgan Honeycutt, graduate of Virginia Commonwealth University, working in freelance and for the Hickory Playground nonprofit quarantine project. Maggie McCarrick, graduate of Western Carolina University, attending Indiana State University for a master's degree in exercise science. Travis Poole, graduate of App State University. Lucy Robinson, graduate of App State University, pursuing a career in graphic design. Luke Stover, graduate of North Carolina State University, attending a graduate program in the fall. Sadie Texer, graduate of Butler University, working on the creative team for Digital Media Marketing Company. Jasmine Sayavong, graduate of Mars Hill University, working as a nurse in general surgery at Mission Hospital. Clara Williams, graduate of UNC Chapel Hill, attending Emory University for a master's degree in nursing. David Williams, graduate of UNC Greensboro, pursuing a job in videography. Emmy Williams, graduate of University of Georgia, attending UGA for a master's degree in social work. Lord, now more than ever, we entrust our graduates into your care. You have created these men and women in your image. You have created them to live inside of a big story, your story, the story in which your mission to love all people, places, and things to life, to leave the world better than they found it, is the central mission. Lord, we pray that our graduates' campuses and dorms, their future homes, neighborhoods, and places of work, play, and worship would be better places, more life-giving places, because they are in those places. Where they see hurt, give them healing hands and healing words. Where they sense confusion, give them wisdom. Where they perceive beauty, give them a sense of thankfulness and wonder. Where they encounter scarcity, give them a heart and a passion to contribute and serve. As this chapter closes, so too a new one begins. Help both them and us, empower us all to move from a time of despair to hope, from divisiveness to, to neighborliness and from being strangers to being the body of Christ. Fill their minds with your thoughts, their bodies with your strength, their hearts with your dreams that they might love and serve you this day and every day. We pray for the class of 2020 and for each of us in the name of the one who walks this journey with us. Amen. Friends, when our hearts are full of love, when we get bumped, Love is what will spill over. We invite you to continue your generous giving to the church. You may do so online or mail in or drop by your offering or pledge. The morning offering.
Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we ask you to be with us as we hear this word, both read from your book and proclaimed from this pulpit. By the power of your spirit, make it your word to your church this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading today is from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know what you are feeling when you see those images, but they just break my heart. I feel sad. I feel angry. I feel helpless. And at times, I feel absolutely hopeless. And when I look at this, I say, there is something terribly wrong. There's something wrong in the human condition. Something wrong in our nation. Something wrong in each of these scenes. There's something terribly wrong. Though we may disagree, and do disagree on precisely what is wrong, I hope we can all agree that it is not okay for Gregory and Travis McMichael and William Bryan, three armed white men in Glenn County, Georgia, to chase down and kill a 25-year-old unarmed black man, Ahmaud Arbery who was simply jogging through the neighborhood. It is not okay for Amy Cooper to threaten to call the police and invoke the old story of a white woman fearing attack by a predatory black man when all Christian Cooper asked her to do is obey the law. Leash your dog, please so he could continue bird watching. It is not okay for four Minneapolis police officers to pin a handcuffed man to the ground for almost nine minutes, one with his knee on his neck. George Floyd tells them repeatedly, I can't breathe. Bystanders plead for his life. He addresses them as sir. He cries out for his mother, who died two years earlier. It is also not okay for peaceful protest to turn into riots. It is not okay to burn police cars and loot businesses. 
It is not okay for fringe groups and foreign governments to spread disinformation and fan, fan the flames of chaos, of anger and violence, flames that are already burning so hot. Though we will disagree on precisely what is wrong, on who is responsible, and what we need to do about it. I hope we can all agree that the God we know in the scriptures and in our hearts, the God who loves this world so much that he sent his own child to prove it, the God who in Christ has already broken down the walls of hostility that divide us, this God is not pleased with us now. I don't read a lot of poetry, but I was reminded this week of Langston Hughes' well-known poem, Harlem. It speaks of a dream deferred. The dream in the poem refers to the dream of black Americans for the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, for equality, for dignity, for opportunity. I've asked my friend, Pastor David Roberts of Morningstar First Baptist Church, to read it for us this morning. And I thank him in advance, both for his friendship and for being with us today. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fosters like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? or curse and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? As you surely know, the dream deferred has exploded over the past couple of weeks throughout cities in America. As generations of anger and rage born of systemic injustice and racism have boiled over, protests devolve into riots, leading to violence and destruction, often in the very communities that have borne the brunt of historical racial injustice. And though the violence against life and the destruction of property is wrong, it is also understandable. Bishop Claude Alexander, senior pastor of the Park Church in Charlotte, put it this way, people all across the country are expressing their anger in legitimate and illegitimate ways. Unfortunately, when people have expressed it legitimately and don't see change, or they feel they do not have access to be legitimately heard, then they do what they know will be heard. Years ago, Dr. King put it this way, riots are the language of the unheard. And though there are outside elements trying to use the protests to advance their own cause, we must not resist hearing the legitimate message just because some people use illegitimate tactics. So what is the message we need to hear? And when we hear it, what are we to do? That's what many white people ask. It's what I ask. What does this mean and what can I do? The answer, or at least an answer, is that we can educate white people in the realities of race and the racism that still permeates our nation. I have been pulled over by the police several times in my life, not proud of that. But I have never feared for my life when it has happened. I have never pulled into a parking spot at the mall and had the people sitting in the car next to me see me and immediately lock their door. I've never been followed through Home Depot 
on a Saturday afternoon. I've never not gotten a job because of the color of my skin. I've never been the subject of a neighborhood watch social media post warning res re residents that I'm walking through the neighborhood. And I've never, ever had to teach my kids how to avoid getting hurt when they leave the house. I've never had to have the talk with my kids. I didn't just make these things up. No, all of these racial microaggressions, all of these things happened personally and continue to happen to friends of mine who are African-American pastors. You and I need to listen. We need to hear, we need to understand that there, though there have been many advances over the years, though there has definitely been progress, we still have so very far to go. And that journey forward will require white people to truly understand the history and the present reality of the racism that still manifests itself in so many ugly ways. To that end, I want to encourage you to join me in a 21-day racial equity challenge. Starting next Sunday, I invite you to read something, watch something, listen to something, or talk to someone with the intent of educating yourself, or better yet, of being educated by those who live it every day. We will provide you a list of resources, articles, documentaries, TED Talks, podcasts, interviews, short videos. We will plan a couple of Zoom meetings to process what we're learning. So I hope you'll join me in this because I know I still have a lot to learn. But, my sisters and brothers, this cannot only be an intellectual exercise. Though that's what we Presbyterians do best, our response cannot stop with education and discussion. Again, last weekend, Bishop Alexander offered his call to white churches to break white silence about race. He said, America must be recreated into a nation that is anti-racist. And this calls for conscience, conviction, and courage. More specifically, it calls for whites to assume leadership and responsibility that frankly has never been assumed before. He went on to quote an article entitled, How Do I Make Sure I'm Not Raising the Next Amy Cooper? She was the white woman who threatened to call police and claim she feared being assaulted by an African-American man. The article was by religion professor Jennifer Harvey. She writes, white silence is a statement about race. When we don't break white silence with ongoing and explicit teaching about race and racism and active and persistent modeling of anti-racism, we end up raising the Amy Coopers of the next generation. We white parents have two choices. We can either go along with the racism enabling flow of white silence, or we can stand up against it. We must teach those lessons to our kids. Now, this is not comfortable for any of us. It's hard to talk about the realities of race in America. It's especially hard to talk about this in this divisive and hyper-partisan world we live in. This is not comfortable for me to preach on. On this Trinity Sunday, I would much rather wax eloquent on one of the church's most mysterious doctrines. It's hard to face our history. It's hard to face 
what we need to do and how we need to think over 400 years after the first enslaved people were brought from, to this country from the African continent. It's hard to hold up a mirror to ourselves and to face our own biases and stereotypes. It makes us defensive. We aren't racist, are we? We don't use the N-word. We don't hold hatred in our hearts for brown and black people. It's hard to unlearn things we were taught as children. It's hard to acknowledge that though we have studied hard and worked hard and struggled hard, that we have benefited from a system that has favored us over others, that has given us a head start because our skin happens to have less melanin in it. COVID-19 was already revealing the breadth and the depth of the inequality in our land. Yet because of the sheer number of tragic events recently and because of the graphic quality of the videos, we can't hide. We just can't shut our eyes. Even though some of us may be seeing this for the very first time. It's not comfortable, I know. And it's a whole lot easier just to turn our heads, just to stay silent. But as Brian Stevenson has said, we can't create justice if we insist on doing the things that are comfortable and convenient. It just doesn't work that way. Yet too often we are complacent. I am complacent. And I want to do better. As a person, I want to do better. And I want, as your pastor, to help you and this congregation do better. I don't know what that means exactly, though I have some ideas. The 21-day racial equity challenge is a starting place, but it is only a starting place. I can tell you that the Hickory area ministers met by Zoom on Thursday and the attendance was up three or fourfold. Pastors who had never before showed up to a meeting showed up and it was wonderful. And as a result, we may have other congregations join us in the 21-day challenge. We may organize cross-congregational opportunities for black and brown and white people to know each other well enough to begin to have the honest and hard conversations that have to take place for authentic relationships. And we may do other things. We just ran out of time. As I said earlier, this is not comfortable for me. And I offer this sermon to God and to you with more than a healthy dose of fear and trepidation. I especially fear two things. One, that you and I are at such different places when it comes to race in America. That you have read such different authors, listened to such different people, have had such different life experiences, that we see the issues and the challenges of race in America in very different ways. Well, if that describes you, one, I want to thank you for sticking with this sermon to the end. And two, I would really like to have a conversation with you if that is something that you would permit. And the second thing I fear is that you think I'm trying to make you feel guilty. With all that's going on, here's Malone laying another big guilt trip on me. Well, the fact is, guilt is the Holy Spirit's job, not mine. Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. And as a former Baptist, I know something about sin. And there is really something, when the Spirit is at work, there is something that we might call good guilt. It's a thing. And good guilt, 
Again, when it comes from the Spirit, good guilt is always expressing itself in growth, in change, in transformation into the likeness of Christ. I mentioned earlier that in the church year, this is Trinity Sunday, which, as you know, follows right after Pentecost Sunday. Now, I won't for a minute pretend that I understand the Trinity. And frankly, I don't trust people who say they do. But I do sense that after Pentecost, the earliest followers of Jesus had to deal with the fact that their preconceived notions of God no longer worked. I mean, how do you wrap your head around the God of Israel who becomes flesh in Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit? How do you do that? I can't explain it. But I do understand this, that God's very essence is oneness in diversity. One God in three persons is what we sang earlier. And if God's very essence is oneness in diversity, then this must be God's desire for us. And here's why I think that matters. When I look with my limited perspective at the state of our union, when I contemplate the challenges that we face as a nation, I see no path forward for us as Americans if we do not create space for genuine relationships with people who are different from us. People who believe differently, people who think differently, and especially people who are from different social, racial, and ethnic groups from our own. There is surely a need for protests and statements and calls to reform the very structures of our society. There is need for deep reflection and study and honest confession and genuine repentance for how we are complicit in and benefit from the structures that support racism. And there is a need for prayer to the God who can make a way where there seems to be no way. But in the end, we are still human beings. And if we do not have genuine, mutual, and even risky relationships with persons who are beyond our experience and comfort, we will not get there. Because just as we have come to name God by our actual experience of God as Father, Son, and Spirit, so also we can only know and appreciate and love others in and through actual relationships, person to person. This is not a quick fix. It is a long road. But I believe it is the way to finally arrive at what Dr. King envisioned, the beloved community. A community that more clearly matches God's essence and a community that embodies God's dreams for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, in Christ, God reconciles himself to all things, creation and creature. We rejoice that nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. This table is the ongoing statement that nothing, not death, not the present things of life, not powers, principalities, not distance, far or near, will ever be able to separate us from God's love. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right 
to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Lord, we often need reminders of your great acts in creation. We need reminders of your presence throughout history in our good times and bad. We recall through the ages of lives lived before ours that you chose a people to be your own, to be witness to your blessing and love for all the world. We remember how the night sky was your promise to Abraham that more stars than he could count would be the number of people who would witness to your glory. We are reminded that though you loved your people, they often strayed and needed the voices of prophets and priests to turn their hearts back to you. We know that in the fullness of your time, a baby was born, one who sang the song of love, a child who spoke the words of prophets, a man who gave all of himself for your work in the world. When your son took his last breath, it was to breathe forgiveness and reconciliation for all people, the ones you loved and the ones you di who did not love you. And when Christ rose from the dead, his breath was peace and shalom, a wholeness when the world seemed so broken. Lord, we continue to need reminders of your great acts in creation. We still need reminders of your presence in our lives today, steady, constant, active. And so, with steadfast hope, we recall that you told us you would be with us even to the end of the age. Pour out your Spirit again, like you have done before, so that prophetic voices might be heard. Pour out your Spirit again, like an ever-flowing stream, so that our hearts may be open to your abundance again. Pour out your Spirit again, so that the fire of your words might burn deep in our bones. Gracious God, this table where we meet you, in bread and cup, is our collective reminder that nothing, not race, not politics, not upheaval, not one thing can stand between us and the love of God. And so we are bold to trust in this table that calls us to remember who we are and whose we are. We are bold to hope that your word stands as other things crumble. We are bold to love where there is hate. We are bold to call on you in prayer as Christ, in whom all things are held together, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord was at table with his disciples. And after supper, he took some of the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and pouring it before them, he said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all sin. Take and drink, and do so remembering me. Friends, every time we eat this bread and drink from this cup, 
we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again, and come again he will. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Christ, you have enfolded us into the household and family of God. We pray that one day this table would be so crowded with saints and sinners, with all who yearn for justice, who yearn for peace, who yearn for reconciliation, would find that here. May this table empower us to be the hands and feet of your self-giving servant love for all people. Amen.
friends, one last reminder about the graduate parade tonight. I hope to see you here. The graduates and their family would love to see you here. Certainly, there is a place for protests, for statements, for actions that address the underlying issues of racism in our society. There is a place for study and prayer to the God who can make a way where there is no way. But I do believe that the hope for us as a congregation, for Christians, and for our world is in genuine, authentic, risky relationships with people who are different from us. Last Sunday morning, I was feeling bummed out. I was feeling depressed. I was needing encouragement. So I took a long walk. I came home, and I worshiped in our worship service online. And then I took a shower, and I went to Morningstar First Baptist Church for worship. You've already heard Pastor David Roberts, who read the poem. I just needed to be encouraged. And I needed to be in relationship with people that I had already built a bond with. I was encouraged. I got what I needed, and I thank the Spirit for that. And what I want for all of us in Hickory and throughout this nation is to have people and places we can go to where we know we are loved, accepted, affirmed. I pray that for you. I pray that for our nation. And I ask you to really consider joining us in the 21-day racial equity challenge. We need to learn, and we need to listen. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the power, and the communion of the Spirit be with each and every one of you, both now and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen.